<laughs> I had to ask him to tone it down a little bit. I can remember when I was younger and, you know, Granny, I was thinking about this over this last week when we used to pull in tobacco. And um, I can remember being out in the fields and, and on the way to the fields talking with my cousins and, and sometimes we would uh, we would put things in our hats so that they would come down over our necks. Any of y'all know why we did that? It's the sun. The sun. Yeah. The sunburn and Lord help you if you ever got some of that tobacco gum on you. Because that stuff's better than two part epoxy. <laughs> but mostly it was for the sun. And I can remember having conversations with uh, I don't know if y'all remember BJ um, and my cousin Lee. and um, I don't know why it ever come down to this, but it, we always thought it was a tragic insult to be called a redneck. <laughs> this, was back, I, this was back then, uh, you know, years and years ago. And when I, I can remember riding the school bus, and if somebody called somebody a redneck, it was fighting time. I mean, it was. I mean, it was not a polite thing to call somebody. But nowadays, what is it? Cool. Yeah, it's cool. It's something to hold on to. We can. I guess we can thank our friends Jeff Foxworthy and Bill Engvall and Larry the Cable Guy and uh, all those for kind of making it a bit more uh, acceptable. But it used to be terrible. Hated being called that. What is it about that being a redneck? What was it? It was something we used to hate, the idea of. It's because people associated it with being uncouth, I guess, or maybe unsophisticated or uneducated. Well, nowadays we've embraced the uncouth, the unsophisticated, and the uneducated, haven't we? Boy, says, how's that going for us? <laughs> Yeah. I bring it up because we're going to read today about some folks that would probably easy, easily be uh, categorized as rednecks. You've probably heard of them, the shepherds. You remember the shepherds in the Bible? Think about what shepherds, what they were like, what they had to be like. They probably smelled like their sheep. That's not a great smell. They probably had rough clothes. They probably burped out loud and didn't say excuse me. <laughs> probably some other noises too. Rough, right? Because I mean, think about what they had to do. If you, I mean, if you read the 23rd Psalm and some of the other things in the Bible, uh, like when, when, when David told King Saul, he said, here's why I'm qualified to go after Goliath. I've watched my father's sheep. I've beat off the, the wolf and I beat off the lion and the bear and, and all these things. And, and, and God got me through it. But think about what shepherds had to do. What type of brain does that take? What type of abilities and, and toughness does it take to be a shepherd? And yet all throughout history, you can go all the way back to when... Uh, uh, the, the Israelites were in Egypt. Shepherds were despised. But they were very necessary. It's weird, the balance there, isn't it? People despise very often the thing that they need. And so here we're going to talk about some shepherds who people have probably looked down on their entire life. They've, they're poor uneducated, they're rough and tough, and uh, their best friends are sheep. And let's see how God interacts with them. This is at, just after Jesus was born, by the way. It says, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you uh, good news, uh, good news of great joy that will be for all the people. 
Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for who? You. Who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for who? You. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a great multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Shepherds are outcasts, my friends. And yet, when we talk about the, see if I can get my little clicker work with him here. Hope I'm having battery issues. Could y'all pop me back two slides, please? Thank you. Now, this is the angel talking to the shepherds. Baby Jesus has just been born. Nobody else knows except those right around Mary and Jacob. Or Joseph, sorry. But he said, yet this message says, I proclaim to you good news. And then if y'all could forward me one more. This will be a sign for who? You. 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 He's not talking to the whole world at this point. Who is the angel talking to? Jesus. <laughs> Why on earth is the first people that God announces the birth of Jesus to shepherds? Why is it them? Why not Herod in his palace? Why not Caesar Augustus in Rome? Why not the wealthy and the rich and the powerful? Just a bunch of stinky guys hanging out on a hill in the middle of the night listening to sheep belches. Those guys. I think, and, and, and this is after doing some, some reading and in other places and a few other things that it has to do with God's message to the world from the very beginning. Let me see if I can actually get some cooperation out of my... Oh, I've got forward ability. There's another scripture in Luke chapter 4, um, it, and, and it comes to us at the very beginning of his ministry. So think about this. At the very beginning of Jesus' life, a message to the shepherds, right? And then at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he goes back to Nazareth, which is, is where he was brought up, right? He goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and I guess they, they recognized his uh, smartness, that he was a bright boy, and they said, why don't you read the scroll today? And so they opened the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, uh, and it says this, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to what? Preach good news to the poor. Preach good news. That's the main part, but that next piece is very important. To who? The poor. The poor. He sent me to proclaim release to who? The captives. The captives. And recovery of sight to who? The blind. To set free who? Repressed. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Oh, back one more. There we go. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. This is at the beginning of his ministry. At the beginning of his ministry, it comes out and he says, good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, setting free the oppressed. Do you kind of catch a theme here? The beginning of his life, 
glory to God in the highest, but it was shepherds that found out first. Now at the beginning of his ministry. And here's something else interesting. You know, the psalm that we read from today was from Psalm 22. It's the psalm that if you read the, if, if you read like when Jesus is on the cross and it's getting ready to wind down and end, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the opening to Psalm 22. He was quoting it. And as in the habit of that day, when you, when you quote a piece of scripture like that, it's supposed, everybody else is supposed to remember the rest of that scripture. And so if you read the rest of Psalm 22, the part that we read was talking about God setting free the oppressed, wasn't it? From the beginning to the end of Jesus's life, his ministry message was to come to those who are broken and hurt and lost and oppressed and in pain, people suffering under the burden of sin, people who know that they need something more than what they have, but yet can't find the power to get out from under it. That is who God has been speaking to. Like when Jesus says that he did not come to call those who didn't think they needed a position, but to those who thought they did. Jesus came to the shepherds to continue the message that God has even for us today. That he loves us intensely and that no matter what the brokenness and the hurt the thing that sets you apart in life is the thing where you feel oppressed he has come to lift that from you and to make you a part of his kingdom where you have a place at his table and you are his child carrying his name operating in this world in his power and his glory Why is this not the message that we tell people? That God has this waiting for them. There's something else that's in this message that if you read the scriptures around the ones we've read today, anytime God shares this message of hope, that he wants to lift us out of our brokenness and destruction, the people who are in power and in control resist it. They resist it uh, even so much as to bring death and destruction to those carrying it. What happened when Herod found out that a, a king of the Jews had been born? What did he do? Kill the babies. He tried, yeah, he killed all the babies in Bethlehem that were two years and under. <clears throat> and in this passage that we just read, where Jesus read from the Isaiah scroll, as soon as, when he finished reading that, and there was a few more verses, it enraged the people of his hometown so much they were going to throw him down from a cliff. How's that for a homecoming? <laughs> they were going to throw him off of a cliff. They were going to kill him because he's, he's preaching this message, and the people in power and in control... Even people in their regular everyday life that are so used to the things that they have and they want, they don't like those changes, do they? How many of us like change and upset when we're comfortable with something? Anybody? I, I, I hate change when it makes me uncomfortable. Positively despise it. But very often, when I catch my when, when when I hear that whisper and God catches me and, and makes sure that I'm paying attention, that's when I start to figure out that God's doing something where a change has to be made. And then I have to ask the question: Am I the one in power, or am I, am I the broken one that needs healing? It's a question we should all ask ourselves, I think. So who did Jesus, I mean, this, this, uh, all this message shows up throughout Jesus' ministry. And, and, and maybe if we want to know how it should go inside the church, maybe a question we should ask is, you know, who did Jesus hang out with? 
when he was in ministry, who did he hang out with? You know, his, his main people around him were a bunch of rough old fishermen, weren't they? Or young fishermen. Traitors to the people. Prostitute. Remember to call it adultery. Sick people. Hurt people. Broke people. Thieves. Liars. Cheats. Is it any wonder that people didn't want to hang around Jesus? What a crowd, right? But that's where Jesus was. We have to ask ourselves, who are we hanging around? Are we trying to share the message of God's grace and mercy with those who need it the most? And I'm going to challenge you a little bit today. I want you to think, I, I, I went through all these categories and, and, I, and I thought to myself, yeah, I can hang out with people like that if, if I got to share God's love with them. But then I got to that one category because tax collector is a weird thing. It's not tax collector like we think of it as somebody, you know, uh, IRS agent or a county tax agent or anything. No, these were people that were actively cheating the people around them. They were Jewish people cheating other Jewish people, not only to give money to the Romans, but to keep money for themselves. They were considered desperate traitors to their people. And if you think about it today, I'm sure you could think of some people out there that show up in the news that you probably think of as a traitor. The news is really good at painting people with those colors, aren't they? Now, this is me challenging y'all, so, you know, if y'all get upset, talk to the deacons, fine, whatever. <laughs> but think about this for a second. Black Lives Matter protesters. How do y'all feel when y'all see that on the news? What do you think about those folks? I know. I don't feel good about it either. I hate it when I see it. But that's the way the people of Jesus' day felt about tax collectors. Antifa. That crew. I'm not saying Jesus was going to go out of his way to go hang out with those, you know, a bunch of anarchists, but... He hung out with people that everybody else hated. And I mean despised. He talked to a woman at a well who was not only somebody that would have made him unclean if she was Jewish just for him to be around, but the fact that she, she, she was a, uh, uh, the fact that she was, her people were a mixed breed between the Jewish people and the Gentile people made her doubly so. But yet he went and talked to her at the well and she became one of the first missionaries for Jesus because she went back to her city and told people all about him. That's who Jesus hung out with, the people that were despised by the society around him. And so I want us to think today, who did Jesus hang around and are we willing to love people that same way? Because if we believe that Jesus Christ came and paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, and that the power that God displayed there is the power that destroys the sin in our life and allows us to be brought back and reconnected with God, and the gift of the Holy Spirit is ours at that point. If we believe that, then surely, just as Jesus went and connected with these folks that everybody hated, he can change the ones in our day too. Because the point of the gospel isn't that Jesus goes to the ones that everybody hates. It's that everybody who encountered Jesus was changed by Jesus. That's the message of Christmas, my friends. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever is a mighty big word, my friends. I invite you to think about it this week. Let's pray.
thank you, Jesus, so much that you did not think it impossible to save us, but rather you shed your glory in heaven and came as a baby and dwelled among us and not only showed us the power of God in resurrection, but showed us the deep love of God and the fact that you came as one of us. You lived like we did. You died. You were one of us in that cradle. Thank you, God, for sharing that with us, sharing yourself. We look forward to the day you return and we can see you face to face. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.